before the next panel, I think I'd like to um, introduce to you an inspiring person. Um, it's actually a success story from last year's Culture Summit. All right? Um, this is something what we here at the summit are looking for, sort of genuine, organic collaborations just between the uh, guests. You know, they come here, they sit, they chat, they share ideas, and then something clicks, and they decide, let's do something about it. So we've got Zainab al-Hashmi, who is an artist from the UAE, conceptual art and site-specific installation. Um, <clears throat> she, um, she's got work showing in the, in the Louvre, Abu Dhabi. And during um, the visit of the guests, um, she, uh, she was approached. So this, this happened at the Culture Summit. So during the, their visit at the, at the Louvre Museum, she was approached by Charles Lindsay from SETI Institute, SETI spelled S-E-T-I, for the Art in Residence program in Silicon Valley, San Francisco. So um, just came back about 10 days ago, I believe, and they've got the research grant for two years, and which was supported and funded by Teshkil. So if I could just welcome uh, Zainab, give her two minutes to share with us that journey, that success story. Uh, Zainab, I'd say, okay. If you could kindly stand up, and here's the mic. Just get it close to your mouth, please. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so I have been invited in the Cultural Summit for the past uh, three years, for this time for the third time. And uh, through the Cultural Summit, I got the chance to meet a lot of uh, new friends and old friends and people from not just the art scene and culture scene, but also from all kinds of backgrounds, different cultures and uh, different countries as well. So um, it was very interesting because last year over <clears throat> one of the uh, lunch um, um, events where we were sitting and I was actually discussing with my friend uh, the buffet, you know, just talking about the food that was served uh, at the summit. I was interfered by Charles and said, um, I'd like to talk more about, you know, to talk about people from the region, from the culture. So we start talking and then Charles asked me, by the way, we're going to the museum, are you joining? I said, I think I might skip this time because I've been there a few times, but if you're going, I'd like to join you. But in any way, if I don't meet you there, please have a look at my work. It's in the, it's in in the lower plaza, which was part of the cultural uh, program in the, in the French cultural program which, with, uh, with uh, the tourism culture in Abu Dhabi. And they have introdu introduced a few artists from the region, not just local artists, who have their work uh, commissioned in the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Um, I got a, the same night, I got an email from Charles asking me whether I'd like to participate in the program, which is basically, in, uh, City Institute is a science institution. Um, they work for, with scientists from NASA on different kind of funding for science research. And the idea of science and art made complete sense for me in my terms of uh, the focus and work that I actually am interested in. Um, so I applied and through a different, um, uh, uh, Charles is the director of the institution, uh, sorry, the director of the art and residence, which had, he had to go through all of the other um, scientists as well, including Jill Tarter, who is the founder, and also uh, Frank uh, Drake, if anyone's familiar with the scientist, he's the one that discovered the Drake uh, equation. Mm -hmm. I just got yes. back from, um, spending a good month there in the Silicon Valley and being introduced not just to the City Institute, but all of the other um, parts that makes the cultural and science and tech uh, in Silicon Valley, which, qu which is quite very interesting for me as an artist. Uh, it kind of stimulates and advances the way I look at my work today and how I could reflect it over here. Um, again, like this is in participation with not just City Institute, but also Lucas Arts Residency, Montalvo Arts Center, who's supporting this. I'm staying there in, uh, in San Jose, as well San Jose Museum, uh, the Berkeley Arts Center. All of them were a big support. I went to Stanford University as well. Um, so all of this kind of experience happened within the past month, and there's more to come. So hopefully something's gonna come out of it by the end of the research. It's a three-year uh, program, it's a as two, I understood. It's a two oh, years two. to three years, depending Fantastic. on the research. Yes. Basically, the research could be an interest between the, art, the artist and Exciting. the scientist. I'm working with the scientist, Mark Showalter, who has discovered 
few moons and mm. planetary rings only. <laughs> and um, uh, so the idea is like to find a, a common interest and they are interested in, in uh, extraterrestrial intelligence as well. So it's an open invitation Fantastic. and discussion. Thank for you. That Thank you very much, Zainab. Please, <laughs> join me in uh, thanking her. Thank you again, uh, once again. This is, the, this is the kind of collaborations that we are seeking here at the summit. Organic, you know, sort of self-driven by people who are passionate uh, on the topic. So uh, we're moving on to our next panel. We talked about uh, cultural diplomacy as a tool and its impact for good or, or, or bad, uh, but definitely for, for a positive sort of change. Um, we looked at technology in media and where all the challenges lie, and we looked at a very exciting, I heard from an, a very exciting um, uh, um, agent of culture, uh, Zainab, who talked about her success story. Um, so the next panel looks at museums. So how, how can museum, museums creatively embrace the digital age? In a rapidly changing world, museums must devise strategies that allow them to adapt to both current and future digital tools and resources. How can museums embrace the digital age in ways to enhance the visitor's experience? And how can museums adapt to the immersive demands of digital art? I have the honor to introduce Troy. Please, welcome. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for coming, of course. Uh, Troy is a curator of architecture and digital initiatives uh, from the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum. Troy, you have the floor. Hello, hi, thank you. Um, actually, I'm going to ask the, the rest of the panelists to come out and join me right from the start. Um, and since you all have all the information in front of you, um, I'm actually, instead of giving a formal introduction yeah. to, uh, of the panelists to start, we're going to introduce them as we go and kind of roll into a conversation. So please join me. Um, thank you very much to our hosts. What a lovely event and venue. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, Last night, I flew in uh, from Paris, although I have to admit, I'm still kind of on New York time, so I couldn't sleep. Uh, and so I watched a, a kind of documentary to put myself to sleep, and it was, it was about rock climbers in the United States. Um, and, and the idea was that they, had, they were trying to climb, for the first time ever, they were trying to climb a, a, a rock face that was basically thought of to be unclimbable. It was in Yosemite in, in the United States, um, and it was about a, a thousand meters tall of kind of sheer granite. And so these rock climbers for seven years, um, they repelled down from the top and tried to look for the tiniest little crack to hold on to and mapped out a path. And then finally after seven years of preparations, they, they took to it. And one was a kind of super expert climber um, and the other was slightly a little bit out of his uh, comfort zone. And so they went up and it took about 19 days to climb this thing. And about 10 or so days up the mountain, the expert climber made it across an area and was waiting for the other guy and camping out on the kind of tent on the side of the rock. And the other guy couldn't get across. Um, and finally, they decided, OK, we have to split up. So the first, the expert climber decides to keep going up. Um, and, and then when he's almost at the top, um, because it's an American movie, and in America, you can't have a movie unless it has a happy ending and everybody wins. Um, he decided to wait for the other guy, and finally the other guy made it across the traverse and, and they went up together. And I was kind of thinking of this uh, during the, the previous panel about journalism, because I was uh, brought to the Guggenheim five years ago um, as the first uh, curator of architecture and digital initiatives, or basically the first curator that would take on the digital at the museum, and one of the first museums to do so in the world. And the mandate that, was, that I felt from the museum was um, the museums were now going through, uh, in 2014 and 15, what journalism had gone through 10 or 15 years earlier, which was the kind of finally feeling the pressure of disruption. Um, and now, five years later, I'm thinking about this rock climbing. It almost feels like we were the museums trying to catch up to the expert rock climbers, to the journalists. Um, and increasingly, I'm thinking now that I, I wish the museums would be left on the wall. I wish they wouldn't get to the top. Um, I feel like we're, if we are truly living in a digital age, then digital is not really the summit. Um, and the idea that once you've gotten to the top of the digital summit that you can rest is actually a, a harrowing, a terrifying idea, because then what do you conquer next? And so I'd like to think that museums and the art world would be kind of left hanging on the wall and looking for a different summit. Um, and to do so in the digital age where 
things like disruption, um, digital acceleration, and so on, are no longer new and dangerous things, but are just a given. This is just the world we live in. And so I think I'm joined with uh, a panel here um, who's able to speak to different aspects of this from different perspectives. Um, this wasn't planned, but we have two artists on the right, and, uh, well, actually, and a trained artist uh, on the left, but two people representing more the kind of um, institutional side on the left. Um, and so we're gonna zigzag back and forth. Um, I'm gonna start by throwing it to Emeka Agbo, who's an artist from Lagos, Nigeria, who's now living between Lagos and Berlin, and in fact, even in Paris, uh, where he's uh, currently a resident at uh, Columbia University Residency. And, um, and the idea is, if, if this panel, if the idea is that the digital is no longer new and exciting, then there's even more pressure if you're, say, an artist working with digital things to explain and express why what you're doing is, is interesting, new, important, and why um, uh, we should pay attention. And I think your work um, has been doing that in a way that has never had to rely on the kind of newfangledness of the digital. Um, and you've been actually quite, as we were speaking last night, open uh, to the role of the digital in your work. So I'm, I'm curious, Emika, as, as, a, as an artist that works in an installation format, um, what is, how are you thinking of the way that the digital can relate to some of the issues you have, which you were saying last night, are issues like preservation and documentation? How do you take something that's supposed to be an experience, almost like what we, what we just had 15 minutes ago, um, and, and bring that into the space of the museum, which traditionally was about collecting and archiving and preserving? Uh, thank you, Troy. Um, I think that exercise 15 minutes ago was a bad idea because it basically says forget everything, you know. <laughs> so, but um, jumping on your question, I'm a, I'm a sound and installation artist. I'm Nigerian. These factors really make me embrace um, virtual reality or the digital form in the art because um, as an installation artist, I create immersive environment of sound for museums or museum spaces. And then these works get to be documented only through photography and uh, maybe video. And to me, it's really not adequate enough in the presentation or um, documentation of these works because maybe in future, it's a situation of where you have to reinstall these works if they are going for acquisition or how do you present it to the next curator that tries to experience this work and you have pictures, you have videos, and these really do not cut across, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, really been, it's been really important to embrace virtual reality because it's as close as experiencing the real thing. And also that is where the Nigerian factor come in. I'm not really, I cannot really show my work in my country. We do not have these infrastructures in terms of museum spaces and size to show massive <laughs> Sound, immersive sound installations that I produce. And um, in many ways, a lot of people back home or a lot of students do not really know my work per se, or they've not had that opportunity to experience these works because not everyone can travel to take more than to experience these installations. Um, I think uh, virtual reality is also this medium that can be able to bridge this gap, bridge this divide where we do not have this kind of museum spaces where I can install my works, but what could be the alternative form to have these things experienced um, for those that do not know my work. So I had to embrace uh, virtual reality, and I think the museums also really have to think in that direction, which they are doing already, but mm -hmm. most times the documentation of works in the museum spaces are limited to photography and videos, and it doesn't cut. So one of the opening topics we wanted to start with was this, this, uh, this kind of tension between accessibility and authenticity. And I think there's a number of artists who will say, we were talking about this last night, uh, work that you do in, in some cases, these immersive sound experiences. And some artists that work in a similar field would say, you can't listen to this work unless it's the perfect speaker, the perfect pitch. And you're actually saying that, that the accessibility, the, the ability to bring that work back to Africa and back to other, or into other, other audiences in the world outweighs the, the, the desire to be a perfectionist as an artist? Um, it's, it's not possible to create that perfect situation. Even when you want specific kind of speakers, you also have to think about the ambience of the space where the work has been installed. It's not, it cannot be precise. You know, I think uh, any alternative that is close to it can also work. 
and that's how I see uh, virtual reality. In terms of non-immersive works like paintings, where they'll tell you, oh, I really need to feel the, or sort of connect to the texture of these paintings. Museums are already in that virtual situation because the truth is we are not allowed to touch these works in the museum. We have to stand behind this line. It's, it's close to that. The sculptural works or some artworks are placed in vitrines, like between, uh, uh, inside glasses. You cannot access this thing. So I think that is not so much of an excuse in terms of having virtual reality as an alternative to um, experiencing these works. Yeah. Excuse, I like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use that to pivot to, uh, to Lizzie. Youngma, who, who just joined us this morning, actually, uh, just rolled in from, from Amsterdam. And Lizzie, you, you were, I mean, if, if the Guggenheim was one of the early museums to take on a digital curatorial position, you were one of the absolute pioneers. You were with the, <laughs> Thank you. the Rijksmuseum, uh, helping them to kind of understand what the 21st century would be. Um, and since you've left, and now, now you're working to preserve a different kind of heritage, World War II heritage okay. across more than 200 museums in Europe to, in, as I understand it, a kind of virtual environment. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering how, you know, if, if how, does, how does your experience and the work that you're doing now relate to um, how Emika speaks about his work as an artist? Well, he, he was talking about so many interesting things. Um, one of the things is authenticity. Uh, in my uh, opinion, authenticity usually is an excuse to not having to do anything. <laughs> so a museum just says, oh no, we have the authentic piece of work, you have to come to my museum and see it. And then, of course, it's completely out of context, so how authentic is the experience of this specific object? And then there's a line, so you're not allowed to come close to the work of art. Um, so I worked at the Rijksmuseum, and um, we were in a very disruptive situation. The museum was closed for 10 years. I can advise you all, rebuild your museum, take 10 years and just be closed mm. so you have time to do other things than you know, just showing works of art. <laughs> we, for the first time, had time to think about new ways of showing our art, our collection to the world. Uh, so the Rijksmuseum has 1.2 million objects and there are 6,000 on display. So we can talk all about uh, authenticity and the true experience. Uh, but for most works of art, the true experience is laying in a box in storage facility. And that's it. That's where it's stuck. And then, of course, we're still happy because that is physical material. Uh, your work will probably end up on a floppy disk mm -hmm. and we will no longer have a machine to read it. So it will, <laughs> it's gone. So um, we decided that we wanted to liberate all these little works of art that were hidden away from everyone. As a museum, you have an educational task. Uh, you have to share your collection and help people get access to collection. So we started digitizing it and putting it online as open data. So you can download it for free. It's all CC0, no copyright claims from the museum. Uh, and I think it's the way to go for museums. Most museums said, oh, no, it's either not authentic or no one will come to the museum because it's all online. Well, I beg to differ. If you put it online, people will see it and they will want to have the real experience with the real work of art. So by putting your collection online, you're promoting who you are, you're showing what you've got. It's everyone is doing it, it's not just a museum thing. So the, the Rijksmuseum, when it reopened, it doubled in numbers, in visitor numbers. Mm -hmm. So actually I think putting it online gets you, gets more attention from the audience, gets you more visitors. Uh, but also, you can start recreate the past and show everything you're not showing. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm really an advocate for opening up collection. I, I was just with our, with our director from the Guggenheim, Richard Armstrong, at, um, at an uh, Art Basel in, in Hong Kong, and we were meeting with a number of collectors. And now, collectors, of course, have a similar problem. They have all this work, but they don't have necessarily the ability to, to put it in. And a number of them are going into the kind of the virtual environment um, um, uh, approach. I'm curious. So once you left the Rijksmuseum, now now you're working in a yeah. totally virtual space. So yeah. what is what is what you're doing now? Um, we're digitizing or connecting digitized works about the Second World War in the uh, in the Netherlands. So it's it, we we estimate that 
500 or more organizations worldwide have archives, photographs, movies, objects, anything about Second World War. Also a lot of information about people. And so it's, it's completely spread across the world. So if you're interested in what happened to your family, you have to go to at least five, six, seven, eight different organizations. You have to be able to find them, know what to ask. Uh, know how to interpret what you get from them, because, for instance, archival material usually is very complicated for non-archivists. So what we're doing is we're digitizing it and we're using new semantic technology to make sense out of... Uh, we now have 11 million digital objects. So we try and make sense out of them and present it in new ways to the audience. So if you're looking for a specific event or you're looking for a specific person, uh, our portal is the the point where you can start looking or even see the digital object that you're looking for. Um, and the most interesting problem is that we're reconstructing lives of people. So we have uh, uh, 50 different archival archives referencing to people, usually just a name. And what we're trying to do is use semantic technology to recreate lives of people. So you can see who was arrested when, deported to which camp, then deported to what camp, what happened in the camp and then, you know, or at the battleground and so on. So we're the first uh, online place where you can find this kind of information. Mm. And it, thank you. <laughs> but you can only do this if people are willing to open up their collection, willing to share what they have and use disruptive mm. technology to match things. So we're no longer doing what people are doing at home on their own. We're doing it with computers, and then you can scale up. We currently have 250,000 people in our database. That's incredible. I, it, I had the pleasure last night of, of meeting actually with Emika and Takashi. Uh, I think Kristen Park from the MFA Boston, who will speak later, uh, who will speak later in the conference, and, and she was doing a similar thing, but with living populations now. Okay. So I think it, it's, it's pretty incredible that you can see how the technology is, is not time-dependent, it's not about history, it's not about the present, it can cut across. Yeah. And it can bring stories of the past right into the present, and it can bring invisible stories of the present in, in, into visibility. Yeah. So it, it's funny that you know, one of the holy grails of virtual reality is this concept of presence. Mm -hmm. But presence is, is defined technologically as sort of when you, um, almost in the past, the, the last meditation exercise, when you kind of lose yourself and you don't even realize you're in a different world, mm -hmm. um, maybe we need to kind of update what we, the kind of standards for what presence counts for and what we bring into our, our present understanding. Um, speaking of moving into the present, um, yeah. Afinan uh, uh, Pashyanda, uh, you've lived a number of different lives. Uh, trained as an artist, <laughs> earned a PhD, uh, have been curating for you know, the last three decades, um, uh, uh, climbed the kind of institutional ladder all the way to the very top as the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Culture in, in Thailand, and very recently launched the first um, Bangkok. Uh, uh, Bangkok, Bangkok Biennale, Biennale um, which you were saying just uh, is, is almost, it's still open, right? If just just finished in okay. February. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. so I was going to say get on yeah. a plane and go see it. <laughs> get on a plane and a time machine and go see it. Um, uh, incredibly successful, I think two million people uh, engaged with art in, in Bangkok, thanks to you. Um, and, and that Biennale uh, spread itself throughout the whole city, right? It wasn't 20 just venues, yeah, 20 right. venues. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about this and, and also in the context of what was the thinking process as a, as a curator, a director, and, and an instigator of a new project in the digital age? And, and what was the kind of, did, did you take technology into account yeah. uh, when you were doing this? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I just want to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's, it's a great honor and, it, and it's a really amazing experience to be here. Uh, we live in a grave new world, and I think we all are digital addicts. So I think when we talk about uh, digital art, we have to put it in context as well as museum. Because in museum context, uh, there are the haves and the have-nots. You know, at the moment, we look at the future of the museum with digital development and digital maturity. But not all museums are rich. Not all museums have plenty of budget to develop. Sometimes technology and art does not go well. Zeus, who produced nine daughters, the nine muses, actually the patrons of art and sciences, actually produced a new muse, which is called Digitalia. Mm. Digitalia 
has arrived, and she's suave, sexy, and she's a plagiarist. She has the ability to steal and do anything she likes with the media. So in this way, in the museum context and the Bangkok Art Biennale context, I'm just trying to put in condition that how art can go outside museum context, can be interactive and be reciprocal with the visitors. And we had 20 venues, uh, many of them along the Japaya River. I'm sure many of you have been to Bangkok as tourists or visitors. And we actually used the royal temples, the Temple of Dawn, Temple of Reclining Buddha, Temple of the Iron Fence, and we actually use digital in context of tradition. So in this way, this mixing actually makes people very inquisitive. And it's a challenging because uh, people feel that it's, it's, is it you know, taboo? It, are we <coughs> going into the areas where it's not should be done? But for, for example, I give you an example of uh, a work by Anon Nong Yao. He's a very young artist, and he uses sound and sensors and installation in the context of the sermon hall in the Temple of the Fence, Iron Fence. So when people visit, they actually experience the chanting of the sermon, the prayers, as well as the contemporary art that Anon actually uses. So in this way, it's like, like Marcos was doing, this meditation. Mm. And we get to the state where chanting, praying is a form of communication. It's, it's a pre-digital age, but we are also trying to communicate. We want to get rid of all the pollution around us, and we want to be at self and try to find ourselves. So in this way, digital and temple art mm. mixes strangely, but it becomes something of, of uh, I think people, a lot of people like it. And you know, other temples, we actually use uh, films, uh, videos. So in, in this context, we, we try to make the public realize that uh, you know, there, there are 300, 400 biennales all over the world, and people ask, why have another one? So we try to make it uh, challenging, and, and at times, we, 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 t we walk nimbly on certain areas which uh, are very challenging. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. So you <clears throat> it's interesting you bring up the kind of have and have nots. Um, and, and, and you told me just briefly uh, in a previous conversation we had that um, I, was, I was really enthralled and excited that you're putting art inside of temples. And you mentioned that in, in these temples, the prayer practices have a, a I think you, you casually use the word hallucination. It has a kind of visionary aspect to it. And as somebody who was raised kind of nominally Catholic in Western Canada, going to church was like, you know, it, it was... It was a thing you had to kind of suffer through. It was sort of uh, there was nothing visionary, nothing hallucinatory, nothing nothing fully embodied or engaging. Um, and but but you know in the have and have not scenario, the fact that you're you're in a place where um, when people go into temples, they might actually have a kind of experience that um, art critics have been talking about for a century. You know, a kind of Greenbergian experience of standing in front of the painting and almost having this religious ex ecstasy. Um, but in, in, I find in the West, that's not a common feeling. It's not something people are used to tapping into. And I'm sure now with, I think, 90, uh, people here from 90 different countries, 90 potentially different cultures, during Marcos's uh, performance, I'm sure the meditation, there are some people here that could go a lot deeper than others. Mm, mm, and mm. so if, if maybe you might be in a have-not position when it comes to museum resources or digital, you're in a have position mm. when it comes to an audience that actually is able to engage with art in a much more transcendental or, or uh, kind of intense way. Mm. Um, is that, is, is, is that, am I just projecting as a kind of Western art? No, 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 no. Um, that... the, the theme of the uh, Bangkok Art Biennale was uh, Beyond Bliss. Mm. Beyond Bliss actually challenges the artist. You know, if you have excessive bliss, you become very unhappy. So beyond bliss is like a middle path where you don't have too much happiness, not too much greed, a little greed, but not too much, mm. and, and you, you can live with it and prolong, prolong this happiness. So we proposed this idea to Marina Abramovich, who, who accepted you know, immediately, and she came and stayed three weeks. Yeah. And she had the Marina Abramovich Institute with all the eight, eight artists, performance artists with us for three weeks, and they performed for eight hours a day, meaning no food, no water, no toilet, and it became like a perseverance, a stamina practice. Uh, many of you know about Marina's work, but this, these artists, these students actually arouse mm. the, the audience, and the, the Thai audience, they've never seen anything like that, mm. you know, in context of 
art and intense performance. So in this way, um, the halves meaning that uh, when they see it and this eight-hour practice is all almost very meditative, mm. you know. And also we have the uh, the idea of people coming and resting, just like what Marcos is doing. And and you can rest, you can sleep, you can meditate uh, with earphones or not, because uh, she feels that this is a sort of uh, place where you, she calls it uh, like um, super time. You know, like the time where you can be with yourself and you can get rid of the outside external influences. So in this way, uh, she she actually rejects. But she's now, as you know, also using augmented reality and VR, yeah. and with uh, the use of technology, uh, she's actually using and crossing over many areas where she she becomes like you know hallucinated or. Uh, hypnotize us mm. so that we can go through augmented reality and VR and experience it with her. And she mm. talks about um, climate change. Mm. She, she talks about glaciers uh, melting and we actually control the water mm. uh, and she fights. So in this way, cultural responsibility in this discussion, we have to talk something maybe outside the context of museum and digital also. Meaning, you know, what, what are we doing here? Yeah. You know, you know the, the, the climate, the poverty, the pollution, and in, in museums, they need to address these issues. Mm. Otherwise, it becomes just temples of the art. Right. Yet another temple of the art where we come and enjoy ourselves, and it's comfort zones. Mm. In that way, we leave, and, and then what? So I, I think we have to you know, tread on dangerous areas as well, to jolt us out of the context that going to museums, okay, entertainment, education, research, but be aware of you know, the situation that, that we are in the great new world. Yeah, it's quite interesting because I was thinking you, you introduced this, this term, this new muse, digitalia, and I'm thinking, was Marina Abramovich possessed by a new muse? But it <laughs> seems like it's a kind of, it seems like it's a kind of, um, uh, it's a collaborative force where digitalia riding on the wave of, of bigger issues that we face collectively is something where maybe the digital addiction breaks down into a kind of digital tool. Um, mm -hmm. as opposed to a kind of compulsive force. Yeah. Um, and, so, and so I want to bring Takashi, you've been so patient. Um, uh, Takashi and I uh, had the pleasure of meeting just over a month ago at an event that, oh, did I cut out? Yeah. Hello? Uh, Hello? Yeah, I can hear. <laughs> <laughs> Meditative. <laughs> Shout really loud and talk in a circle. I'm back. Oh, I'm back. I'm back. Hello. Okay. Hello. Uh, now I have a prop. Um, I was just saying, Takashi and I had the pleasure of meeting just over a month ago in San Francisco, where colleagues of mine, Alexander Monroe and, and Zhao Rei Xu Nowell, who are here, um, organized a really beautiful um, and profoundly kind of um, uh, introspective event. Um, uh, our fifth. Asian Art Council, where they invited a, a Chinese philosopher, Yu Kui, who had recently written a book introducing uh, uh, an idea called, that he called cosmotechnics. And it was basically the idea that, you, that it was a kind of fool's errand to try to create a philosophy of technology that was universalizing, that could apply to all cultures and all places and all times, that technology itself was never a kind of um, basic universal, but it was always rooted in a cosmology. It was always rooted in a kind of deeper understanding, a cultural understanding. Um, and Takashi and I uh, had the pleasure of going through this together. And Takashi, I just saw you last night for the first time, and you said you've had this kind of, well, I was gonna, you, 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 I'll put words in your mouth. You said you've become enlightened as a result of reflecting on this. And um, just as by way of a brief introduction, Takashi Kudo is from Team Lab uh, in Japan. Uh, I asked him earlier, do I refer to you as Kudo Takashi or Takashi Kudo? And he said, just call me Team Lab, because <laughs> um, even though we're 650 people in, in Japan, um, uh, nobody knows the names of Daft Punk. So you just refer to them as Daft Punk. Uh, so I'll refer to you as Team Lab. But um, Takashi Team Lab, um, can, you, can you give us a little thinking? Because I think Apanon is diving us a little bit deeper into the fact that the digital is not just a technological veneer or layer. It has deeper kind of cultural roots and transformative roots. And, and you've recently found yourself, while meditating on this, 
coming up with a new way of thinking. Can you share that? Yeah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. And it's before I gonna speak, that I a little bit want to talk, and it's an appreciate of this, this space because I was born in uh, Tokyo, but I grew up in Abu Dhabi, and this isn't the first time in these 30 years, and I didn't expect to come up like here, here like this, and I'm a little bit no nostalgic feeling, and it's a little bit nervous for that, so. I just wanted to appreciate all this and hold uh, these opportunities. And uh, yeah, what are the questions? <laughs> <laughs> in two, in, Takashi, in two minutes or less, explain to us the difference yes. between to be and to have. Oh yeah, that's good questions. And it's uh, actually it's in we team labs. It's maybe it's uh, not so many people know about us. So we are digital art like collectives. It's a uh, 650 members. And we try to create something to update the digitals. And uh, we are like uh, CG animators, software engineers, hardware engineers, and mathematicians. And we make a teams and this make output. And this point is in uh, our artworks is, why our work is the softwares. It does not exist. And it's uh, for us, it's uh, two things, it's a uh, first, for team labs, we have it's very much interested in it and how the relationship between the human and the world, with the human and its other peoples. That is the first things we want to explain, and it's a, we try to find some things and to process to create some things. And the second part is, you know, of course, we are using you know, digital technologies, but uh, that is not on our purpose, and it's core part of this in our output but it's just not super important. That's just on the tools and it's material for us. And it's a uh, thing is, is um, what we try to create is uh, we try to create something of it in like, uh, this physical world. And uh, today's maybe digital technology is how to expand with the humanities. And it's uh, somehow it's in, uh, you know, we Japanese even didn't have it's a word of ego. And we didn't know it's what is an I know, like independent persons. And there was no boundary between in, uh, the personals and the societies and the personal and the natures. So what we wanna do is uh, we wanted to create uh, this, instead of this now, uh, expand with the humanities, we want to expand with this physical world because we can bring the people to be inside of it in our output with physical bodies. And it's, uh, the thing is, like, uh, uh, we, at least me, I have interest with how understand of the world. But uh, we not understand the world just in the brains. We understand the world with physical bodies. I have four years old sons. And um, when I see him always in a relationship between he and the world, is like more physicals. I try to explain to him it's about it's what is a coffee, and it is very bitter, and it's maybe it's a ban it, but he tried, and it's him ban it, and he can understand the coffees. The thing is, we understand the world with physical bodies, so it's we wanted to make it now this physical space and try to bring the people to be with physical bodies and participate of that. And after that, you're going to be one part of this in artworks. It means there is no boundary between the visitors and artworks. And that is you know, one thing. And one more thing, and uh, I'm so sorry, Can, so we don't do have time, right? Do you mind if I jump in? Yeah. Is that totally rude? Because we, we've only just got a little bit over a minute left, and I wanted to get, it's okay? <laughs> oh, Back to you, excellent. Takashi. Thank you. <laughs> Shukran. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to say it's a, this is my personal it's a problem. So it's, an, it's not official point of it's in a team labs, but it's a, the point is I cannot understand to have somehow. And uh, I speak it by English. It's an, I'm using in a hub, but it's a, still I don't understand it's a to have. And it's for me, it's an, I have some kind of disconnected to the world. 
And uh, today's society, it seems like uh, based on uh, to have. But in fact, I feel it's an, uh, we cannot have anything. And this is all illusions. That is what I feel. But uh, I can understand to be some things. And to be is uh, something that we can understand some things. And it's uh, our artworks, it's, uh, we cannot have our artworks. Uh, sorry, it's, uh, we are sending over it in our editions. So it's, uh, it should be have too. And it's, I want to sell our artworks, but, but anyway, it's, you know, <laughs> the point is uh, our installations, it's, uh, you're gonna be one part of it in the world artwork. And to be is maybe important, and it's in the next societies, is uh, maybe we have to think of this and how to base on in the two Bs. And the point is just one thing. Uh, I'm so sorry, it's if you want, uh, I can give you the waters. <laughs> so it's in the point is in a, I got my son, but I have never said I have son. And it's my son, it's game makes me to be fathers. And that is the first time so I be something. And it's always eternal, like uh, if you think about some, it's whole the whole internet and the things. And there is no service and the new no nothing to have. It's, there is just only two Bs. And it's, uh, it makes sense. It, it makes great sense, and I know we're a little bit, but I wanted to s carve out another 30 seconds because we wanted to get... Oh, I'm so sorry. One, no, 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 it's great, and thank you. Um, because you've actually inspired what I think is how we should lead into the workshop this afternoon. So I, I think it, 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 it was profoundly interesting to me to hear that the digital, which is technological and new, was actually inspiring in you what actually feels like a totally different way of being in the world than a Western collecting way, which is where... Now I'm getting cut out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I thought that was a clue. Um, I wanted to just throw it to Emeka because I think you had this, this really beautiful and brilliant and provocative idea last night that, that I think does a really nice job of summarizing things we were saying and, and provides a provocation that I think we'll take on on the, uh, on the workshop this afternoon. So maybe just 30 seconds or less, could you pitch us on, on, on the thinking that you had last night? Um, uh, maybe it's not going to be a very popular... Uh, <laughs> Well, basically, um, there's this whole topic around repatriation of artworks uh, from Europe, stolen artworks from Europe to Africa. And I think this is going to be a very long process and we'll probably end up having another generation of Africans that never get to experience their heritage. You know, like I grew up, um, the Benny Burns head has always been in the British Museum. There was no connection for me with this. It's basically on textbooks which do not completely explain this thing. I kind of think, you know, in relation to virtual reality, sorry about that, but I really think uh, a kind of temporary compromise where we try to figure out how this um, artworks will be brought back home because they have to be brought back home. It's really moving in the direction of a virtual museum for these works because we'll end up having another generation of Africans that cannot connect to their heritage while we are waiting for this to be resolved, and I don't think the resolution can be, uh, is anywhere near. So uh, for me, it's really about creating a museum of these artworks virtually and accessible to everyone. Because uh, like you. you mentioned, have some of these works actually in crates. In Berlin, there's probably over 70,000 artifacts from Africa, and they are never all on display. Some of them have never been displayed, so we don't even know what these works are. So this could be a temporary compromise, I will sub this out. Thank you. Yeah, so if, if one of the objectives of the summit is to come away with actions, this is something I think we're going to workshop later this afternoon. So thank you for bringing it to the table. Thank you all. Um, and thank you again to the audience and our hosts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rory. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick.